We play and call it work. Hey everybody, Matthew and Luca here from MiniBoardGaming.com and we are happy today to bring you General's Handbook 2019. Woo! A pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah. Well, we knew it was coming, right? But we want to walk you through. Now, Games Workshop does a great job of previewing their content and showing stuff on Warhammer Community. So we don't want to just repeat everything they're saying. At the same time, we do because you might want to hear our spin on it. So what this video is, and we are going to be doing more videos and reviewing more of the parts because it's just too much to talk about in one video. Yeah, that's a lot. This video is going to be Luca and I talking about our first impressions. We haven't played any games yet nope. from the stuff in the General's Handbook 2019. We're going to be playing a crap ton of them over the next week, and so you can look forward. There should actually be battle reports up today as well. Uh, there'll be, we'll put links in the description below. Uh, they'll probably be in the Mini Wargaming Vault as well. So you can check out those as soon as possible because you want to see the new uh, meeting engagements in I, play. We're playing so much of that. Oh, that's so much fun. I've always wanted a reason to play smaller points games, but actually have them properly crafted to be smaller points games. Right. So that's meeting engagements. So there's a lot of changes here. We got some major changes to open war, um, open play, sorry. Very big changes to pitched battle. <sighs> and match play. Narrative play remains as you would see. There's, there are definitely a lot of new things in narrative play, especially like mercenaries and, and uh, the street fighting, all, yeah. that, all that kind of stuff. But I'm, so I'm not saying that narrative play didn't change. I'm just saying it's, it's more of what you'd expect from it, like lots of different ways to play the game in a less competitive, more narrative way. But I would say that open play and match play have seen some significant updates with the way that they work uh, compared to 2018. So this video, we're going to go back and forth. We're going to go through the book, through the various areas, and just talk about our thoughts on some of the changes. We'll, uh, now it actually comes separately. And rather than having the, the points in the General's Handbook, when you buy it, don't worry, you'll get this. Yeah. It actually comes in the bundle, a little pamphlet of the Pitch Battle Profiles. All your points right here. Yes. Like what, 50 yes. pages? Yeah. And we'll, I, I, if we Less. have time in this video, we'll quickly go over any of the major changes here, because there have been a lot of points changes, mostly decreases across the board, except for the armies that have been updated over the past six to 12 months. Um, and so we want to highlight some of those. We're not going to go over every detail of every change. We're not going to go over every points change. That would take forever, but we do want to have a good discussion of what we like. And then what we want you to do for us is two things. One is leave comments below of what you'd like us to talk about what uh, questions you have about the General's Handbook while it's on pre-order. Maybe you haven't had a chance to read it, or maybe you have had a chance to read it at your local store, and you have questions about how you think some of the things will work in your games. And we'll do our best to cover that in future videos in uh, discussing the General's Handbook 2019. Okay? okay? Right. Right. So, where do we start? Well, we could try to, I don't want to say avoid pitch battles, because I think we're going to get hung up on a lot of the changes for pitch battles. So maybe hit a, a few of the smaller changes first. Okay. Maybe. What would you like to start with? So I don't do a whole lot of the narrative stuff. I don't know how many people out there do, but they've given you some structure to it. Instead of just saying, throw down 100 points, your opponent throws down, oh sorry, 100 wounds, and your opponent throws down 100 wounds. Now they have this whole point-based build system so for... that's the open play when you're That's open play, yeah. Sorry, not narrative play. I, I do get those confused a lot. I'm talking about open play. Open play, lots of changes. The narrative stuff is all the same, essentially, other than streets added... Well, added it's it's very... I want to point out, it's very different. There's a lot of new things in it, but it's, it's, a, it's same the same concept, like concept where <laughs> it's like cool ways to play, yeah. but if you're looking for a balanced game, it's stay far away from it because that's not really what it's for. It's meant to provide challenges and provide a really narrative way to play. So it's kind of like uh, the, the open war is a little ironic, I guess, because they have a lot of structure to it now. Or you can have a lot of structure to it now if you so choose. You have multiple methods of setting up your terrain, multiple methods of setting up your armies, and very random in nature, it seems. It's, it's, in, it's interesting because just recently I started working on a draft format for Agency Mark campaign. Bam, and there you go, they got it. <laughs> well, they do and they don't. It's not the same. It's, but it's, it's, the idea behind the draft format is that I wanted a way to have more random armies but still have some control over it. And so we've developed a draft system, which we're having fun with, um, where you, you, know, you pick multiple factions, you combine them, and then you're offered selections from that and you pick which ones you want for your army. And so you don't have total control, but you have some control. 
So the open play in the past has always been bring whatever you have, and the way that they would balance it, and it would be it's a horrible way of balancing it, is that you would total the number of wounds. Yeah. So I have a hundred wounds worth of guys, you have a hundred wounds worth of guys. The thing about that is that a wound is not equivalent to a wound. Um, like it's just they're, they're just they're just not the same because one of the wounds could have a three plus save, the other one could be have a six up save. Or a model with the wounds can take half damage from weapons. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, there's little things like that. Like five liberators, that's ten wounds. Ten stabbers are also ten wounds. Those <laughs> yeah. five liberators are far superior oh, yeah. to those ten stabbers. Or like a, it's a mortar that has eleven wounds compared to like the ten wounds, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. It's just, if they're not, it doesn't work. And so it, it was always disappointing to me that they had this cool way of like, you know, you sit back, relax, just play a game with your friends, and it's totally unbalanced and doesn't make any sense. <laughs> But yet they had some really neat things like the open play, or so the open war generator, which would randomly generate your scenarios, the way you deploy, your there would be twists to it. And I liked that. So we would always just kind of combine them. We'd do like pitch battle profile to build your army, and then we use the open war cards to build it. And now they have an open war army generator. Oh yeah. Where let, let's just the basic idea is it defines different types of units now. For example, a horde is defined as a unit that has up to 20 models with one wound each and a save of either 6 plus or nothing. Whereas a regular unit is up to 10 models with one wound each with a save of 3 plus to 5 plus. Elites would be 5 models with 2 or 3 wounds. Guards are 3 models with 4 or 5 wounds. And so on and so forth. So they, so they have like uh, 8 different definitions of different kinds of units all the way up to heroes and then heroes that are on monsters as well. Right. And then what you do is before the game starts, you decide on a force point limit, which is usually a number between 15 and 30. And then you start randomly generating your army. And the way you do that is it has a... I don't know if you can see it that well, but... Well, it's, it's a D66 chart. And I'd like to imagine I'm gonna, with a card, a little deck of oh, cards. Oh, I would love to have a deck of cards to do this yeah. if, they, if they come up with that. You, just, you, you deal yourself out your army. Right. Now, it, there are, it, it doesn't just work as simply as that because you roll your d66 and let's say you get a 14, for example, 1-4. So you can do one guard unit that costs one force point. So let's say you're playing 15 forces or force points. So you rolled a 14. So now you can add, you used one of your 15 points and you can add a guard unit. And remember, a guard unit is a unit that has up to three models that have four or five wounds. What would that be? Oh, like a Paladin squad for Stormcast Eternals. Right, yeah. yeah. Or, or Gorgrunta's. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, so there's usually, each army usually, like the more fleshed out armies usually have access to something that's in that. And I think it, it, has, it tells you what to do for substitutions. And uh, um, yeah, it basically says when you, you can substitute something from below when you want to do that. And so if you rolled a 26, you could take one champion and one endless spell for two force points. And remember, a champion is a hero that is not a monster. Hmm. So it, it's still not going to be perfectly balanced, but it's, you're not going to know ahead of time exactly what your army is going to consist of, and so it allows you to, to build up a really neat army. So it has a similar feel to like a draft format, but um, I, I actually want to try it out. I, I think I will be trying this out in some of my beat map bat reps uh, as we go along. Well, because well, we have the collection to do something like that too, right? Like, well, where it's you all could... within one army, though. So you don't. That's true. You don't have to. Like, true. What is the restriction? First off, um, agree for size. I don't. Think, I don't even know if they have allegiances. I think you could just whatever you have. It's that. That is the idea of this. That's what the whole open war. It's just kind of whatever you. Whatever you. That's what like first edition was, right? There's no allegiance ability. Just throw down whatever you wanted and just play your game. There was the Grand Allegiances, I guess. There was Grand that. Alliances, yeah. Grand Alliances. Yeah, it doesn't mention anything, as far as I can see really quickly, about choosing even a Grand Alliance. <laughs> really? That's kind of fun. Interesting. So, so, you know, for those who don't have as big a collection as others, then you're, it's still okay. Like, if, obviously, if you have hardly any models, then you're not going to be able to play hardly anything. But um, if you've got, like, a little Sylvaneth army and a little Flesh Eater Quartz army... That's okay. If you want to use this, you can combine those two forces. They don't have their allegiance abilities and all that else, but Open War was never meant to have all that powerful stuff. So you can still have some interesting combos. So I'm, I'm definitely going to be trying this out in the future as well. You can actually generate endless spells for your random army too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they all can use it. And then it has a random way to generate the terrain. It has a random way to generate landscape. It has 
a, oh yeah, and that's really cool because it actually shows you where to place the terrain. Yes. See that right there? They've given you another D66. Place so your terrain like this. 18 different table setups. Now I'm going to be honest here, and this is going to become a sticking point when we talk about pitch battles. I'm not oh, a fan yeah. of that. Because, once again, let's get nice and close. That is an example of what they say that your tables will look like. It's kind of sparse, guys. Now, maybe I am a terrain snob. No, I am a terrain snob. Me too. But you don't take beautiful citadel terrain like that and, just and then just throw it in a garbage fashion yep. in such a way that your table doesn't look nice. No, I, I, okay, let's clarify something. There are limitations. This is, this is going to be something that comes up a few times. Yeah. We have a different experience than a lot of people. We are filming in, in beautiful studios. We have access to an entire hallway, a very long hallway filled with terrain and models. And even like extra term and hold terrain too, if we needed to. It's, it's <laughs> ridiculous. There's so many companies that work with us that uh, get us terrain that we've bought terrain from. We have access to a lot of painters. And so we, we are spoiled, rotten, when it comes to our expectations for what a game looks like. Having said that, I also play somewhat at home, not Warhammer, but I've been playing Battletech and things like that with my nine-year-old son. And when I'm at home, it's paper. And I don't care. I really don't care. And so it's possible that a lot of people are kind of that same thing, where they're playing at home, they're like, I don't need a gorgeous table. You know, here's a few pieces of terrain and I'm happy to go. I think some people just play without terrain too. There's that too, yeah. like if you don't have any. I don't, I don't recommend that at all. At least <laughs> use books or something. Hey, just an open battle. Hey, we both armies agree to fight in an open area. <laughs> yeah, this is like the, Good old, old fantasy days. Yeah, just march across the city. This is this is totally it makes sense, right? Yeah. It's like let's let's keep this honorable because we're just killing each other, so we need honor. But uh, anyway, so so you know, I'm not a fan, fan of that because of where we are here. But I can see for other people, it'd be like, yeah, that's cool. That that gives me a fresh way to set up my terrain. Um, but most likely, if you have a bunch of nice looking citadel terrain, you could probably build a nice table. But I mean, with this setup, you technically only really need is it ten pieces. Ten, yeah, piece, it's ten pieces. Ten pieces six, of six major pieces and four minor pieces. Yes. So, so minor being like walls and little pieces of terrain. It kind of gives you something to work towards at home. If you don't have anything, then you can know like, oh, this is good enough. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear your opinion in the comments below. What is your typical experience? Because I've kind of divorced from the typical experience of a gamer. I 99.999% of my games are filmed in a studio, or I'm assuming that 99.99% of gamers are not filming their games in a studio. Like, so it's like, it's, it's just such an opposite of experience. So I'd love to hear what you think. When it comes to the terrain stuff for, for Games Workshop and for, for war games in general, are you finding yourself typically playing on just whatever you can put together? Or do you, maybe like how some people will never play with unpainted models, are you kind of person that's like, I'll only ever play on a table that looks at least somewhat decent because it just ruins the experience for me if I don't have good terrain? Or are you the kind of person that'll be happily throw down a non-painted army on a table with books and mugs and other things that stand in for terrain and have a blast anyways? I've done that. I've done that lots of times. Before working here, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I could, and I could picture being happy to do that if I'm just at home and I'm just kind of doing whatever. Like the way, it's interesting, like we do our role-playing game show, right? The way I play Dungeons and Dragons at home is very different than how I do oh, it yeah. here. When I do it here, I make an effort to set up a cool table with nice terrain at home. It's a it's a wet it's a, it's a it's a dry erase yeah. mat that I just draw S on. Squiggles. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm happy with that. Whatever. I still make an uh, effort for the miniatures, but the terrain yeah. I just don't bother. So I can I can kind of see how it would work both ways. So I'd love to hear your feedback. And there will be more discussion on terrain when we get to the pitch battle stuff. And I'll, ha I'll have lots of questions for you. <laughs> for different reasons, though. Yeah, different but reasons as same, well. Some of the same reasons, but also very different, too. Uh, it has the, the open work... They have an open work close Post quarters, quarters battle, battle generator, generator. Which is all about... That's um, what it sounds like. It's, it's about, all about like get up and close and personal. In yeah, your you base. start like right away. You're ready to like you're charging turn one, fighting turn one, and yeah, for a lot of the cases. Yeah, and so it has it has those um, with a typical objective twist ruse. I think this is. I don't know if this is meant to replace. Um, uh, you, can you can use, use these instead. tables instead of those found in the open war card deck. I like the open war card. Okay, I mean, oh, what I, I see. Are fine. It's, it's, um, it's here's the difference. The this is implied that it's meant to be played on a smaller table. Oh, gotcha. So that's why I'm like looking at these. I'm like, these aren't very different. Like they are different, but if you're gonna be so far apart that who cares? They're meant to be played on a three by four or even as much as a two and a half by three and a half. 
So roughly the small size of a dining table. That's referenced uh, numerous times throughout yeah, the, yeah, the rest of this book. They're really trying to just, you know make it something that you just play at home or on right. a coffee table or something. They so if you picture our typical tables, it would be half the size of that. Right. They wanted the Sigma to be more accessible. Right. You, you don't have to always play on a six by four. And we have something great. for that in pitch battle as well. Yes. With uh, with the meeting engagement, which we'll be talking about. So that's cool. I I want to try all of this out. Um, I remember when Eighth Edition for Forty K came out. Beat Map Bat Rep became everything not match play because I was like, there's so much cool stuff to try out in Open War and uh, and narrative. I want to do that. So I think for Beat Map Bat Reps for a while, I'll probably try that well, kind of stuff out. Are you gonna, are you gonna do the, uh, the the random terrain nope. setup? <laughs> Didn't think so. Never. <laughs> but I think I can I can agree with you. I want to try I, this, right? I would I would definitely try the army generator. Force point card generator thing, especially, especially if we get a few decks of the cards. Yes, if there's decks of cards, even nicer. Yeah. Like I, they, they, I've been doing this draft campaign, and it's so much fun to not have total control over your army. Now it helps that we have a bigger collection here too than most, but it's just something nice. Like you're always building your list. How do you build the best list? How do you build the best list? Sometimes you just want to be like, like when you play computer games, in a strategy games, sometimes they'll, they'll hand you an army and be like, now win this battle. Yeah. And I like that idea. Like you want to, it's fun to have control and build your list. But sometimes you just want to be like, here's your army, here's their army. Now find a way to win. How do you think? Uh, for me, I would do this total army random generator thing. Especially if I, we have a guest coming, like whatever. We have so many models. Let's do this if you want. I would still probably do pitch battle scenarios. I love those so much. Maybe the open war cards. I would do either one of those. I'd embrace two. the openness of the open war cards. Yeah, they're they're they're. I don't know if silly is the right word, but they're definitely. They, they can be one-sided, but they can also make for some great games. Uh, like the narrative, like the, the pitch battle can be one-sided right? too, right? right? I've seen plenty of one-sided pitch battle. I mean, anybody who complains that open war ends up being more one-sided um, clearly hasn't played a lot of pitch battle either. Yeah. Um, I can see like open play being one-sided because the whole wound thing is weird. But they, could, they could be the type that played one open war game, got tabled almost immediately, then never said, oh, tried yeah, it again. Never, it's, Unbalanced never. garbage. Yeah, but like in a pitch <laughs> battle, I've seen that happen plenty of times. You play, oh, they got a double turn right off the bat, and they happen to be the army that can really take, advert, can take advantage yep. of that, and I've, there's no way I can claw my way back. So, so I would definitely try this. 100%. Just, just exactly as is. 100%. It introduces hidden agendas. I don't want to talk about that too much. It's cool, but it's just not a highlight that I think is... Is worth going over right now. Oh, narrative play. They also have different objective tables and roost tables. I just noticed. Yeah, that yeah, out. yeah. They have their own generation thing for the close quarters battles. Oh, they're actually different too than. Uh, yeah. Cool. Neat. So narrative play introduces a few things. There's only one that I want to go over in detail, which is the mercenaries. But it does offer a streets of death, um, which is obviously meant to be in more. It's the cities of death, from 40k, right? But literally into. Yeah. But it's different rules. It introduces arcane objectives. Which is just another, um, it, it's just a way to personalize your objectives in your narrative battles. So they actually become more than just objective markers. Uh, Regiments of Renown, I'll be honest, I haven't read a lot through this. It's, it's mostly for narrative games if you want to give, a, there's even specific units you can give these specialist or renowned tables uh, upgrades to. You pick a unit and if you want it to be fearsome or give it cool extra rules, you pick a table that is most relevant to your unit and you both get a regiment of renown that are feared and they get upgrades in addition to their normal rules in the game. For example, one of the tables is a spearhead, which is they have to have a save of three, four, or five plus and they have to have a mount. Right. You can give them all plus one wounds. Yeah. Or they can all get um, plus three bravery, but they can never retreat. Uh, or you can have your scouts, which is a unit that has a five plus or worse save with no mount, could have plus two movement. Yeah. Or they ignore the deadly scenery rule because they just know how to make their way through it. Or marksmen, where they have missile weapons, they can get plus one of their hit rolls or plus six inches to the range of their weapons. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, so obviously any of these might sound powerful, and remember, it's narrative, so it's okay. Right, because you can have your opponent can have them too. And, and it's just range. not meant. There, there's there's probably very little effort here to try to balance it because they, in a narrative game, it's not about balance; it's about crafting a story. And sometimes that means somebody being given. Like, there's there's nothing better than your opponent having the advantage over you and you still managing to eke out a victory, either because the dice are in your favor or because you manage some really neat tactics and pull off a victory in the end. So that's what that's what narrative games are all about. And it, it, they, they, they give you the option too. You, you can just pick whichever upgrade you want for them or you can go the fully random route and just like you, all your units can be regiments renowned with random upgrades. It'd be a lot to keep track of. 
but that's something they suggest. You can play this if you play at smaller points. That's true. You just have like five units. I would I would suggest instead that I, I almost want to look at that use those charts in some of my narrative campaigns where I just bring them in. It's like hey, this unit survived. Roll on its table. Yeah. And that's one of that's its upgrade. Kind of like the Path to Glory stuff. We have an entire area of Elixia, the Shattered City, which is introducing a narrative for this. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with the backstory of Elixia, but they, they give you a bunch of battle plans to play there. Yep, I'm not going to talk about those besides the fact that it is in there. I believe it's connected for uh, the quest uh, for Gal Maraz, the Hammer of Sigma. Yeah. yeah. It also introduces raids and ambushes. Ooh. Where it's one side is the attacker, one side is the defender. The defender is not aware of the attacker coming in, and so only some of their guys activate at first, and then the battles kind of go that way. Once again, we're not going to go into details, but it's it's just different ways to do it. Oh, and they have random uh, name generators for your heroes. Yeah, they kind of randomly threw that in there again. It's, just, it's for the narrative play, right? Yeah, why not? Now, the cool part in the narrative that Ooh. I think we should spend a couple minutes on. Old Grave Claw is on page 46. You're almost there. One more page. I was, there we go. I was distracted by names. Yeah, you're like, ooh, a name oh. generator. <laughs> is the mercenary companies. Yes. And these can be included in your pitch battles. So even though it's yeah. in the narrative play section, this actually works in pitch battles. They work just like allies, though, before we go any further, in the sense that they you have your, your maximum points that you can bring for your allies. Yeah, you don't, they can never count as your battle line. The guy can't be your general. Um, and they do count towards your maximum number of leaders, behemoths, and yep. artillery. So you go ahead and talk a bit about what you saw. They, saw what they did here is it looks like they kind of just copied a couple of the ones that came in the new Forbidden Power box set. What, what do you have here is you have one, two, is there six? There's only six, no, right? No, there's the next page, too. Six, there's ten. seven, eight, nine. Ten. So there's ten mercenary companies you can get your hands on. There's a Fire Slayer one. There's a Flesh Eater Court one. There is a, like a Necromancer, Necromancer zombie one. one, Zombie one. We have the, oh, what are these ones here? Oh, Vampire Lord, so like Blood Knight, Soul Blight stuff. You have uh, Gargants. So you can actually have a mercenary company of Gargant brothers. brothers. And they're all brothers, too, yeah. which is kind of cool. And we have... Free guild, so humans, we have, oh, what are they called? The Iron World Arsenal. Arsenal. Arsenal yeah. Artillery, basically. That's kind of interesting, too, because you can just bring them as allies, so I wonder what they would add to your list. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that, yeah. We have Dark Oath, which are not a thing yet, but Chaos Marauders. Oh, I guess you can take the Dark Oath Chieftain, which is just the, what is yeah, that? Yeah, it's the one model. That's true. We have the model. And we have the Marauders, too, so you can take, uh, like, a Mer uh, the Rampagers. We have Chaos Spawn, Warhound, Chaos Gargant 1, and Maneaters. Which, fire Belly. A fire Belly, which are the ogre, which have always been the ogre mercenary ones. So the way this works, and I'm only familiar with the pitch battle one. I'm, I'm assuming the narrative one is just do whatever you want with them, add them to your army if you want, because they don't. It doesn't really matter. It's narrative. We have for pitch battle, they take up your, as Matt said, they take up your ally slots. An example would be the fire slayer one. If you pick this mercenary company to be hired by your army, you can include Fire Slayer units in your army as mercenary units. So to get the mercenary keyword, with the following exception, you cannot have Rune Fathers as mercenary units, which are the big Fire Slayer main leader guy. Yeah, right? They're not going to be mercenary. They're, they they're, they're be too mercenary. busy running their lodges. Exactly. Uh, and then you get a, an ability if you're to add these mercenaries to your army. So in addition to their normal abilities, you would get add one to hit rolls for attacks made with melee weapons by Fire Slayer mercenary units that target enemy units that made a charge move in the same turn. So they like it when you charge them. Exactly. They, they hold the line. You. Yeah. However, from the start of the third battle round, subtract one from the bravery characteristic of friendly Fire Slayer mercenary units while they are not wholly within 18 inches of your general. I guess they start to waver as they're not... No, no, no. They distrust. It actually gives a little fluff. Oh, it does? They fight fiercely for whoever pays them the most. However, these distrustful warriors are known to keep a keen eye on their employer. Okay. So if they're too far away, they, they start looking back. Like, what's going on? To make sure we get paid. Yeah, we've got to make sure we get paid. Give us our gold. <laughs> and it seems that... Oh, and there's, there's an important part that we should point out. Oh, yes. It doesn't matter what Grand Alliance you are. Yes, that's what that was. That was the next one. You could be Death and you could have the Fire Slayers in your army. You could be Destruction and you could have the Lich mercenary group in your army. The mercenaries are cool because they do give you that one extra ability, but not all of them are so free build as the Fire Slayer one. A lot of them do have like a, a force org of their own you have to bring. Yeah, like the first couple, the next one is Flesh Eaters, which is anything except the Royal Terror Geist and Royal Zombie Dragons. But they, any other Flesh Eaters can be brought. But the thing that you have to remember is that they do take up your ally points. Yes. So if you're playing 2,000 points, you can't have more than 400 points of them. I th I'm thinking I would be bringing mercenaries every now and then just for the fun of it. Because why not? 
But it, the problem is, I always have a hard time wanting to bring allies because I, I really, want to maximize the synergy of my army. I was gonna say, your allegiance ability and your own army synergies are so strong, why would you bring allies? It's hard, but yeah. once again, this is found in the narrative play section. Right, it's not meant to be super competitive, right? It's Although, I wouldn't be surprised. There's be, probably something here. Well, for, for example, <laughs> the Fire Slayers, as I have found out with their new book, the Hearthguard Berserkers are ridiculously powerful. They're just hands down a strong unit, even if they have no support. You throw a hero near them and give them their four up to ignore wounds, and they are very powerful. So all of a sudden, your mercenary unit could be one... Hearthguard Berserker squad with a hero? Yeah, yep. exactly. It could just, the hero could be a rune Whatever. smith. To berserker give, even. No, a, yeah. Oh, yeah, even a berserker. Yeah, yeah even cooler. Uh, but, but if you're looking for like maximum value out of it, you bring a rune smith whose prayer is that he can give a fire slayer unit reroll wounds. Yep. And you have him come in with those Hearthguard Berserkers. Heck, they bring the, I think it's the rune smiter who can actually go underground and bring a fire slayer unit with him. So you bring him, a unit of Hearthguard Berserkers, you put them underground, they can pop up on the table. Yep. And then he prays and gives them reroll wounds. And you just have a unit of 10 Hearthguard Berserkers. That'll keep you under the 400 points in a 2,000 point game. And that is a hard hitting unit. And, and very durable. And it can say, pop up anywhere on the table. So I'm thinking they pop up on an objective and they, they sit there on that objective saying, I dare you to charge me. Yes, charge me please. We're getting plus one to hit now and we are rerolling wounds with the prayer you said? Yes. And they're a four well, up to once ignore. Once the prayer gets off, which is, it's, if the turn they show off, they won't be able to do that. And a four up to pass out damage because they have that here nearby them. As they protect heroes, right? Yes, they have that four, little... four up to, No, no, no. They just ignore wounds. Yeah. On a four up. Oh, they don't have to have a hero nearby anymore? No, no. They, the hero nearby is to make it so they have a four up to ignore wounds. Okay, so that was... They don't pass the damage to the hero. That's right. Yeah, they ignore wounds. You're thinking yeah. that's, that's the orc... That's the, uh, the orc hearth guard? I, uh, yeah. yeah, orc hearth guard pass off wounds. So they have a or four up wounds. to ignore damage if they have a hero nearby. Yeah. Is it a six up without a hero? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. But yeah, that's there's that that's like that that could be a good addition to an army cool. that just needs a little extra punch that pops up in the back of the field. Well, I'm thinking a great example is something like the Caradron Overlords. They often lack a strong, meaty unit out front. You could add Fire Slayer Mercenaries to the army. Yeah. Now, and granted, you could already, you could you could already, already do add that, them, but, but now you get, get an ability. They didn't get any benefits. Yeah. Now, mind you, if you put them in the back, they're going to be more than 18 inches away from the enemy, so they're going to be minus one bravery. But these guys are bravery eight. Yeah. And there's only ten of them then. You know, that's not usually going to and be And that an only issue. starts on the third battle round as well. And that's the yeah. first thing that came to my mind. I'm sure the tournament players... Yeah. I, I'm actually curious. I wouldn't be I, surprised. I'm curious if, if we'll find some... If we find one or two auto-includes in a lot of armies where it's the same thing. It's kind of like in 40k. If you're familiar with the Warhammer 40k meta from 7th edition, do you remember how everybody, no matter what their army was, Somehow, three to five flying hive tyrants would always show up yeah. and assist their army. Yeah. Because of the, <laughs> yeah. Old, the old ally rules. And every army included three DACA tyrants, or flyerants, I should say. I have a funny feeling this will allow something similar to happen. Um, now, thankfully, the restrictions on how many points of allies you can bring will keep that to a minimum. But there, I, I, anybody says people will find that one unit to bring. That would, that would really add to that. I guess the narrative restrictions are if a mercenary company is hired by your army, one of every four units in you include in your army can either be an ally or a mercenary unit from your army, from, the, from that company. You also, yeah. the, the other thing I should point out, this is a pretty big deal. They have a disruptive presence, meaning all of your mercenaries do. And at the first battle round, you don't get to get a, an extra command point. Right. So you're, you're paying a command point, which is essentially equivalent to 50 points. Yes, that's what you pay to get command points. Is there, quickly looking, is there a way that mercenaries, so say I'm playing Legion of Gash or whatever, and I want to bring the Sons of the, the Lich Master as a mercenary company. Obviously, they already fit into Legion of Gash. Can they benefit from the, can, I, can they benefit from the Allegiance ability because they have the right keywords? Or is there something that says, can it be a part no, right of here. Your, mercenary units are treated as part of your army, except yeah. that they are not included when working out your army's allegiance and can, can therefore be part of a different, hold on. They cannot be the army's general, cannot use or benefit from your army's allegiance okay, abilities, and cannot be a named character. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm looking, I'm looking at the undead one. I'm like, wow, you know what? This undead one would be... You want, you want a free War Scroll Battalion, don't you? Yeah, that's what it looks like. Because <laughs> look, look at the undead one is one necromancer, zero to three units of zombie skeletons in any combination. So you could bring a brick of 60 zombies or a brick of 40 skeletons because that's if still... you the points for it. You would. Because it counts towards your allies' points. So 40 skeletons is 280 points, and then you throw on the necromancer, and there's your... There's your mercenary company r restrictions there, and they get plus one to their attack characteristic. 
It's huge. Why do skeletons need more attacks? <laughs> they already have. Why was that the thing you gave them? It's they. they Why couldn't it be something else? That gives the. I, 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 Give him a five up deathless minions for all I care. I don't, in, a, as, in a 40 man squad unit, that's four attacks base, just from that mercenary company. And then you have a vampire lord nearby giving them five, six, seven attacks each. <laughs> Why plus one attacks? I don't know what Why were. was that the thing? I don't know. And it's the and it's the exact same. All they have to do is be wholly within 18 inches of the necromancer, which is he's going to be right in the middle of the Yeah, he's gonna be, they're going to be walking around him, <laughs> keeping him alive. But these are all cool. Like, the idea is, like, obviously the fire slayer one seems oh, cool. Plus one attacks to the skeletons. Like, this is... That's like why I'm getting hung up on this, yeah. but it's like... They already have too many attacks. Like seriously, too many attacks. Yeah, they, they get they have one each. They yeah, get yeah, plus yeah. one for twenty. They get, too many, they get tons of it. Everybody by this point is familiar with the four yeah. attack skeletons. Well, they're four attacks with this company base. They're three otherwise. I thought there was another way to get them plus one attack to four. Or command abilities. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. Oh, People yeah. are familiar that you can already buff yeah. skeletons like crazy and then give them dancing the macabre and make yeah, them but that twice. That's four attacks base with no command points being right. spent. That's crazy. Right, <laughs> right, right. Why? Why couldn't have been something else? These, like, uh, like minus two bravery to your opponents. Because like, they're scary. Because they're, they're skeletons. Super, it's a spooky mercenary company Ooh, of skeletons. Minus two bravery. No, plus one attack. Oh, come on. That, that, that's, that's a pretty hard-hitting, pretty durable... Actually, they wouldn't be durable because they don't have the six up to ignore damage in any way, shape, or form. Because they don't have any allegiance abilities. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Your 40 squad doesn't have a six up And they can't come back to life for one command point either. Oh no! So, Except you're still going to be putting D3 back in there with the Necromancer. So. And all the other de- all the other death heroes nearby too, if there are any. If you're doing death, I don't know if you'll want to do this in the. I probably army. not because you because you lose your. You could just bring you could just bring that in the death army. You just lose the one attack, and it's, it's it's not worth giving up a command point and them losing their allegiance ability just to gain plus one attack on the skeletons. So we're not going to go through all the mercenary units, right? Suffice it to say, there's a lot of cool fluff and and uh, just some fun narrative elements to these. But I have a funny feeling that people are also going to find good ways to use these powerfully in a pitched right. battle. There probably is a lot of ways. Yeah, because in narrative, you, your points, you don't have your points restriction, right? Uh, like, who cares? You can bring you know, an entire mercenary company of fire slayers, and it can be half your army. Uh, although it does... You know, I really want to bring... Is it bring... just pitch battle that says it's one out of four that can be brought in? No, that's the narrative. The, the pitch battle one is the, you just use your uh, alliance points or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so you still are limited. It's one out of every four. One of every four units, you include your army, can either be an ally or mercenary. Okay. Yeah, that's the yeah, the narrative restrictions for it. You know what? I kind of wouldn't mind doing the Grug Brothers as just like, something fun to do. The as three mer- Gargants. <laughs> the three Gargants. You can bring one to three Gargants, <laughs> and they get to reroll hit rolls of one, uh, as long as they're within six inches of another one. But yeah. if they're within six inches of two others, they get to reroll all hits. That's kind of cool. So the idea is that you bring the three of them together. Yeah. But when it's one of them dies, and they, they slow down. Maybe you can, so it's fine. They're only 160 points each. Oh, that's not bad. I thought it was a little more than that. But that means you can't fit them in a 2,000 point game. Oh, boo. That's true. So you only bring two. Well, unless you're playing a narrative game. Oh, that's Cause, true. Because the narrative doesn't have a points restriction. It has a number of units restriction. Yeah. So if, as long as you have at least 12 units, then three of them could be the Gargans. But I'm a huge fan of these mercenary companies. I think it's a great idea from Games Workshop. And I look at any of these, and these are all kind of silly and fun. You could have a Chaos Gargant leading Chaos Spawn as a mercenary company. It's, it's Scrab's menagerie of random Chaos Scrap. <laughs> Why not, right? Right. And then we come okay, to... Before, before we get to Pitch Battle, I think we should back up and do something that we should have talked about at the very beginning. Ooh. You're looking at Pitch Battles. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. Page 5. Okay, what is that page 5? Because you didn't tell me about page 5. The new Warhammer Age of Sigmar Players Code. And unfortunately, this means that we can no longer make battle reports. <laughs> Wait a second. Why didn't you? Why didn't you tell me about this? Are we? Are we? Are we done? <laughs> We're done. We can't make battle reports anymore. We'll, st- we'll get to the reason in a second. Just stop. Just stop. We'll get there. We'll get there. I forgot to tell Luffy to read this one beforehand. He didn't tell me to read this at all. <laughs> so, so, hold on. So essentially, the, the way this came about, in all seriousness, this. Just okay, just I'll, I'll stop reading. Hold on, stop reading. I'll stop reading. Right? It. Just listen for a second. It's hilarious. The way this came about is that they were actually legitimately trying to come up with a way to include in the rules conduct stuff. Because they were finding some conduct issues, which uh, anybody who's been to a tournament will have come across some of these. So, for example, somebody slow playing. Oh, meaning, geez. meaning that they take, on purpose. A, they take a long time to play their turn, running the clock down because they know they can win if they don't let the game go on too long. Like they grab enough objectives at first, mm-hmm. or they know they're losing, so they like try to uh, uh, keep their opponent from getting more points. That's one example. Um, measuring properly, not cheating. And they found that they had just read this study or watched this video about a study 
that uh, when people were brought to take a test that they would get money from if they passed or something like that, that um, they, they, had, they signed this code of conduct beforehand saying they wouldn't cheat. And then if, when they were reminded that they signed that code of conduct, they found that the cheating dropped to almost zero just because people signed a code of conduct. Whereas when they didn't, you, you kill, it's killing you not to read it, isn't it? I know. <laughs> so basically they found that if they put a code of conduct in place and reminded people of it, that typically people would follow it, even though the natural inclination is to try to get an advantage. So they created it. Now there's two cardinal rules. So you can go ahead and read them now. Just read them out loud. <clears throat> Always be polite and respectful. No problem. Always tell the truth and, <laughs> and never cheat. That's not a problem, okay? Right. When you get a rule wrong, you're not cheating, okay? <laughs> so stop saying that. So those are the two cardinal rules. You must always follow those. Then there's yep. a bunch of principles. And <laughs> principles. There's, there's five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We're not gonna read all of them. I would but like somebody to put a comment about that, because this was the Games Workshop posted about this. And I'm like, Matthew, you're not gonna be able to make battle reports anymore. Because one of them says, and this is the second to last one, never complain about your bad luck. Or your opponent's good luck. I'm done. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. That's that's Matt. I don't do that. No, no, well, I, I do oh, that come on. I do that all never the time. Never complain about your bad luck. I literally do it all the time. I think we all do it. <laughs> and and I and and I agree with the principle. Right. Where you're just ragging on your opponent, saying, "Oh, you're just good luck." That's the only reason you're winning. Yeah, that's the. That's rude. one thing. That's rude. It's another thing to go. All right, I got thirty attacks. And I just need four sixes, because those sixes do mortal wounds. The rest aren't going to do anything. Blah. No sixes! I didn't get a single six! What the crap? I can't do that anymore? What's the <laughs> point of this game if I can't yell out my dice? I am trying to be, I'm not being impolite to my opponent. I mean, some of you may disagree, and go ahead and disagree in the comments. That's fine. But I find that that's part of the fun of the game, is, just, is yelling out my dice when they go crap. Yeah. And cheering them when, uh, when they do well. Um, no, I, I, would, I don't. As I do, I definitely bring up talking about my opponent's good luck, but it's usually more me complaining about my bad luck. Right. You know, when my opponent has a five up to ignore wounds, and you're like, okay, I totally killed it. I just did 15 wounds to that eight wound guy. Sorry, no, that, that, there's only five wounds left, and I just did 15 wounds. You're fine. I'm fine. He's got you. Blah. Oh, you roll 11 five pluses. How are you still alive? Yeah. Like, why can't I do that? To me, that's that's not only entertaining. To some, <laughs> I I, but I I have fun with that. I got to imagine that they probably mean like yeah. I guess okay. Technically, yes, that is complaining, but in a lighthearted way. Yes. Yeah. And and that's fun, right? I think now, in all seriousness, yeah, there are going to be people who are just going to be like, yeah, you're only winning because you rolled well. Or and that's it, just that's just a jerk move to say. It's kind of like one of those you go to a tournament and the tournament plan is here's these six scenarios, you're, but it's going to be a random scenario every battle round, and then you lose a game and you blame the scenario and you. You say, oh, you didn't do anything good. It was just a scenario. You got yeah, lucky. Yeah, that's impolite. Yes. Okay. Things like that. That's, I, that's what that's trying to hit there. There's a lot of principles. Yeah. Well, I, I like this one. Remind your opponent about rules they may have forgotten to use or which they have used incorrectly. The first part, meaning. Right. Especially when doing so is to your opponent's advantage rather than your own. I love that. That's I, a great principle. I, all, well, I hate gotchas, right? Yes. I hate gotchas. Yes. I always try to tell my opponent, oh, don't forget. I told you. Like A good example would be like... Um, the, the Bone Grinder Gargant, that huge, huge Gargant, he has a rule that if he's within six inches of you, he actually gets to pile in and fight. Oh, so that'll if you get move you within time. six inches of him, but it didn't intend to charge him, he's like, ha-ha, I came up and fight. Gotcha. I, would, I would remind my opponent of that. I'm like, is he? And honestly, every time they charge in, I grab the three-inch widget and, I'm go, and I go, did you intend to engage this other unit as well? Yeah. And sometimes they'll be like, yeah. And other times they'll be like, oh, no. And they'll pull a model back. And I, because I hate the gotchas. Yep. And they happen all the time. is bad for it too, because of that specific reason. Yeah, the th th that, that one's a big one. The, th the forgetting that three inches engages after you charge in, you can easily bring in something you did not intend to. I've heard, I've, I've heard and read online a lot about that being one of the core mechanics of Age of Sigmar though, and that being its big strategy is to outplay your opponent by, if you don't know how to move properly in the charge phase, then you're not, you're no. not gonna learn how to no. play the game properly. No, that is not good sportsman. That's fine That's at a tournament. Right. It's fine if you're like trying to win against your opponent and it's like something big is on the line, but that most 99% of your games are not going to be like that. Right. And so you want to win because you both had a fair chance and you both had fun. Yeah. Um, there's no point in just being like, ha ha. I, I play you, like 10 times. You didn't times realize that on my war scroll, yeah, yeah. I, play, I play so much more than you, so yeah. I'm aware of all the stuff that's in your rules and all the stuff in my rules. Right. So I'm able to perfectly strategize, whereas 
you're penalized because you're new to the game. That's, right. that's like that's what we call gatekeeping, right? And there, Where it keeps people out of the hobby because others refuse heard to that term. allow them in. Maybe I have. Well, it's well, like gatekeeping is typically used when it's like uh, you, you can't enjoy the hobby because you haven't been doing it for 20 years. You're only you're only joining now because it's cool. Like the, oh, a lot wow. of the role playing <laughs> games, right? It's like I've been doing it forever. And I'm embracing it, and so you're new, so you're not as good as me. That's gatekeeping. So I feel like that's kind of a form of gatekeeping too, where you're you're uh, you're abusing the, what your happens to your opponent because he's not as aware of all the stuff that you can do because he's not as experienced as you, or at least with your army. Yeah. So anyway, there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, and I want to imagine a lot of players when they're playing casual games too, they probably don't even realize that. Both players probably don't even realize that you probably put a unit within three inches of another unit because it's it's hard to gauge that three inch. But after playing so much, it's easy to tell. And you can almost call it. It's just like, if you got within three inches there accidentally. But sometimes you can get just within three inches. Right. That's happened to me a few times where I move and I'm like, wait a second. And I bring the widget and I'm like, oh shoot. And I pull back. Yeah. Because I'm still in the middle of my charge. So I would have done it. Yeah. If I hadn't have caught it. There's one more I will read. Oh yes. Uh, Ask your opponent's permission if you wish to use unpainted models. Or proxy models. That's right. You need permission to do it. Oh wow. paint your models. I say because you know I'm a serious painter of models. Hey, they got contrast paints now. The whole the whole theme is there's no excuse to not have uh, unpainted mini or to have not painted minis. Yeah, that one. <laughs> what are we on? Fifty four. I'm a bit of a hypocrite there because I don't paint, but yeah. So <clears throat> pitch battle. Um, so the core, the core pitch battle chart for building your army hasn't changed. It hasn't changed, which the, is good. I like it. The, all the scenarios were updated, but we can summarize those updates quite easily, except for one. <laughs> With the exception of uh, places of arcane power, the Thank scenarios you. did not change. That was such a bad scenario. We'll, we'll, we'll get there that. in a second. We'll get there in a second. The scenarios did not change, but not a single one, except for places of arcane power, did not have their deployment zone changed, meaning all the deployment zones changed. Boop. And in the case, there's, I, I can't say that the other ones didn't totally change. The um, Scorched Earth, the one where you go, there's six objectives, and when you go to your opponent's side, you can yep. destroy their objectives. It now has eight objectives. It's so much cooler now. But it also oh. switched to the, you're on the short sides of the table rather than the long sides. And the um, relocation orb doesn't have nearly as many places it can go, but it can move much further. So those ones changed. And the Star Strike one. The Star Strike has a lot more locations it can be, but yep. you roll 2d6, so that'll tend it towards the middle. Uh, places of Arcane Power, that's the one where there's three objectives and only heroes with artifacts and wizards could hold it. Oh, I never played it because rarely... I always did, rerolled it. Yeah, rarely yeah. did both players have a lot of heroes with artifacts or wizards. And so they just changed that now to be heroes. Yep. So still questionable when it's only heroes that can hold something. Yeah. Because somebody might only have two heroes, even in a larger point game. The argument is that if you're going to build a random pickup game, you should try and build it to do okay. And there's 18 scenarios, though, so that's kind of hard. I can see that. I want to build the army the way I want to build it. And then, but it's a but little you do have to consider now. the objectives. Yeah. You do have to consider the objectives. Yeah. So the only other change, and this is, this is an important one to the basic way you build your army, is before it said for every 50 points you did not spend, you got a command point. Instead of triumph in pitch battles. Right. The triumphs right. disappeared. Yeah. Here, you actually spend 50 points to buy command points. That's they, an important distinction. They because, finally changed it. Yes, because they've reintroduced the triumphs to pitch battle. And they've made six of them in total. They kept three of the same ones and added three more. And the triumph, if you want to remember, uh, was a, what you, an open and narrative play. If one player had less points than the other, they would get to roll on a triumph table, which gave them a once per game Big advantage. Big Yeah. Like rerolling all hits in close combat, or all hits on shooting, or all saving throws, just for one phase. Um, those are still in there. They've added three more, which includes rerolling runs and charges, auto passing battle shock, which is and using command abilities without uh, spending command points. But you still have to roll randomly on the table to see what you get. There's, right. There's no picking. So now the, the player who has less points gets one of these. Right. And that's important because before, if one player had nine, uh, 1960 in a 2000 point game, 1960, and the other one had 1950. The guy at 1950 got a command point, and the guy at 1960 got squat. And it always sucked to get to 1960, because you're like, oh, 10, 10 points less than I have a command point, but I don't want to drop anything and change it. So now, that guy at 1950 will spend the 50 points to get a command point. Going to 2000. And the guy at 1960 will get a triumph. Which is nice. Yeah. Which is not game-breaking, nope. usually, but, but it's, a, it's a nice little enhancement. It's a good take on it. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... Other than what we're about to talk about, that's the only change to how you build your armies. Yep, actually, yep, that's pretty much it. It's, uh, but now how you build your tables are vastly different. <laughs> this, 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 um, this bothers me. But 
there's parts of it that I, I understand where it's coming from. I just, oh, 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 sorry, before we get to that, there are three new command abilities. Oh, this yes! That's kind of a big deal. These can three be Three new huge. command abilities available to all heroes. Heroes can use them 12 inches. Generals can use them 18 inches. They're quite simple. Yeah. One, you use in combat phase, choose a unit, and they reroll ones to hit. One, you choose in the shooting phase, you choose a unit, they reroll ones to hit. Yep. One, you choose in the combat phase, specifically, and they get to reroll ones of saving throws. So it gives you more options for what you can use your command points like, for. Like, right off the top of my mind, oh, my missile shield failed, oh crap, I can all-load defense. I have a command point, I can still at least reroll ones if it's super important to me. Things it also like means buying command points, War Scroll Battalions, becomes more valuable because you have more ways to spend them. And War Scroll Battalions still give you the command points. Yeah. Like they did before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah hasn't no, no, changed. That's, no, that's changed. So, the battlefields. So they say it's, it's fought, an, a, a pitch battle is fought on a 4 by 6 table. But you, it says you must. You must. Must. And it always uses the word must. You first choose your mission. You must then set up your objectives. And then you must set up terrain in the following fashion. You roll off. And then... Oh, well, sorry. First off, each... You put your objectives each, down. Each, yeah, you put the objectives down. Then yep. each player chooses five terrain features from the list on the right. So three primary, two secondary. The primary are like your citadel woods, your ruins, Ophidian archways, or even a, an entire Sigmarite mausoleum. That's the Garden of Moor thing, which is like all the walls and the but crypts like and a, stuff. But it's like a, a strict structure it's to it. It's pretty big, yeah. yeah. Secondary would be walls and fences, just two models, or some other unique... Both of them can be unique to terrain. Yeah. But they tell you how big it is. No more than... Like the large ones can be no more than 10 inches across and no more than 10 tall. I don't know why tall matters. Whereas the smaller ones are no more than six inches across and no more than four inches tall. Yep. So you then roll off and alternate placing the terrain. The terrain can't be placed within six inches of a table edge. So you're going to have no terrain on the six inch edge around yeah, the there's outside. There's a whole perimeter of nothing. <laughs> which, is, which is already boring. It can't be placed within six inches of another piece of terrain. And it can't be placed within three inches of an objective. And remember, the objectives go down first. So you figure out what scenario you're playing first, you put the objectives down, and then you do this whole terrain roll-off thing. So I want to remind you, this is what your table is going to look like then. The same thing, because that's yep. ten pieces of terrain, six major, four minor. And so it looks like there's still lots of room on the table, but here's the problem. First, there's still a lot of room on the table. Yes. And that is boring. It's dreadfully ugly. I don't care what terrain you're using, it's going to look not great. Um, and the second problem is what comes next. Well, I was going to say, yeah, you know what, the, yeah. You know, go ahead. You guys, what were you going to say? I was going to talk about the, the rules for the scenery. That they, oh, but we, yeah, well, that's, that's after this next, but we can talk about that right away if you like. Uh, they have the same, they really, they want you to use the scenery rules. Now, this is must. what I, you must. Must. Now, this is what I wanted to ask those watching now. Do you use the scenery rules? Because if you watch us, then you know that we do not. Yeah, that's the ones that are like, there's a D6 table in yeah. the core rule book. It's like damned, arcane, inspiring, deadly, mystical, and sinister. Right. They've added six more. Now there's 12 of them. So even more to keep track of. Yeah. Do you <laughs> use those rules in general? Uh, so basically what they say is that if you're using a piece of Games Workshop terrain that has a War Scroll, then you just use that War Scroll. But those War exactly. Scrolls usually are one of those right. things. Like right? the Citadel... So one of the new rules is Overgrown, which is the exact same rule as the Citadel Woods. That you can't see through it unless something, unless you're flying or whatever right. you're looking at is flying. So yeah, like Matt said, if you're actually already using Citadel Woods, you don't roll a random scenery table rule, you just use the Citadel Wood rules. But all your unique terrain, you'd have to roll on it, which means you have to have some way to mark it, which means... You're going to have to have all these little dice or little markers on all your terrain. Right. Which, once again, if you're just playing at home and you're just using matter. books and or whatever basic stuff, it's okay to have little stuff. But yeah. when I'm building a table, building a table, not randomly assigning stuff on the table, first off, they, they won't follow these rules at all. Um, and second of all, I don't want to put a little die on every single piece of terrain and then try to remember what all those mean. Now, over time, right. you get used to them and you would remember them, but you still have a little die or token on every single piece of terrain. It just, it makes the, when you're stepping into the game, it makes it just that much more complicated. And now, a veteran, less and less immersive, too. Right, and then as a veteran player, whatever, it's fine. You can figure that out yourself. But you don't get to, you must roll on the random rules, right? You can't pick your old ruined, overgrown ruin to be overgrown, it might be volcanic, right? Right. Things yeah, like that. Yeah, you can't just say all the trees on the table, which are not Citadel Woods, they're actually just our custom tre um, trees, are overgrown. And of course you can. Like, don't get me wrong, you can do all of this. But that's a house rule. But you're making a house rule. Yeah. So I'm talking, because we try 
believe it or not, to use the rules exactly as written because we have a large audience. Who? And so we don't want to have to keep explaining why we're doing things certain ways. Exactly. But I'm not going to use this. And now, tournament, they actually have rules for how to run a tournament, which I, I, I think is cute. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure that they'll use it at Games Workshop. And that, it says the, the tournament uh, the tournament provides, uh, sorry, the tournament organizer sets up the tables. All the tables. And so the tables are all set up. All the train and it's all figured out for you already. So they're not expecting you to do this in tournaments. They're expecting you to do this in pickup games. So you go to your local store or club, you grab some train off the, off the wall and you set it up back and forth. Uh, which I can, uh, that's, that's fine, especially if it's mostly Games Workshop terrain, because then you don't have to put little dice on everything and you can just say, yeah, that's, that's, that's the Citadel Wood, so we know what the Citadel Wood does, we know what the Azurite Ruins do, we know what the Ophidian Archway does. But I'm guessing that the majority of terrain that most people have when they play Age of Sigmar is not official Games Workshop terrain. Like, it's just custom stuff that you'd have to give these scenery rules to. Right. And the, the one thing that, well, I found funny, as we were, we, were, we were curious, well, what rules do these terrain features have from Games Workshop? The Sigmarite Mausoleum. They're, they're all pretty basic. They're, they're obstacles, or they're damned, or they're inspiring, or whatever. But the Sigmarite Mausoleum counts, if you're using Legions of Nagash, it actually counts as an additional gravesite. So there's nothing stopping someone who plays Legions of Nagash to go to a random pickup game and bring three, three Sigmarite Mausoleums with them. So they'd have, because it's an addition to the gravesites they already get, and they get four. So in total, every Legion of Gash player out there could have seven gravesites on the table. Yeah. Why do they give the mausoleum that rule and everything else is like basically... Everything else is pretty straightforward. It's just right. a little piece of terrain, you plop it down. Uh, minus one bravery if you're close to it, or plus one to your casting right. binding if you're close to it. Yeah, whatever. But, um, yeah. Now here's the, here's the big rub, the thing that I hate the most. I, I'm also on the same page. Now this is pitch <laughs> battle only. They're faction terrain. So we're talking about the terrain that you get with your allegiance ability. Not like, holes, altars, uh, your loon shrine. Yeah, yeah, all those kind of things. In a pitched battle, faction terrain must be set up more than six inches from the edge of the battlefield. So that already eliminates the knot holes. Perhaps there's going to be an errata. I have a funny feeling there's going to be an errata for knot holes to change how they there work. There should be. Because yeah. otherwise you just literally eliminated knot holes. Yeah, because so the knot hole it can only be placed within eight inches of a table field. A table Holy edge. within, right? Holy within. And it's too big to not yeah, be it's like this, six inches. It's like this big. Yeah. And Okay, so they can't be set up. They have to be set up more than six inches from the edge of the battlefield. And then more than six inches from any other terrain feature, Yep. and more yep. than three inches from any objective, and they also have to follow their own restrictions. Which is the worst part. So yeah. you have all of that, and you have to use their own restrictions. What happens if you can't place your terrain, Luca? Oh, well, the rule says you just can't use it. <laughs> just put it away and just play the game without it. Now, that model you spent a lot of money on, a lot of time painting, just, you can't and it, it gives some sort of bonus to your army. And sometimes it's even very critical for your army to sometimes, have that. Not always, but sometimes. And you know, you spent the money, you spent the time painting it, and you're really proud of it, and you can't use it. Because, now granted, sure, there's, there might be a, ro a room to put it, but if you're playing against an opponent who might be particularly nasty in this random pickup game, and you, because you put your own train features after all the other train features are put down, this opponent could realize, oh, they have a train feature, I'm gonna put down terrain in such a way that you won't be able to place your terrain feature or in a way that it is useless. So remember, okay, here is your six by four table. So remember, you're already not allowed to place terrain within, like any terrain, within six inches of the table edge. For so whatever you, reason. So you've just lost 12 inches off of each side. Yeah. Which means this is now not a six by four table, but a three by five table of where the yep. terrain and your faction terrain can go. Then you throw objectives on the table. If you're playing Scorched Earth, oh, there are luck. eight objectives. Good luck. Like this. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now, that's a, that's a pretty extreme example, but even if you just have one that's like three objectives down the middle, you can't place terrain, whether it's your faction terrain or the terrain on the table, within three inches of that. So you're going to have these six-inch diameter circles that say no terrain goes here. Then you're going to have to place ten pieces of terrain, six of which are sizable and, yep. th and four of which are smaller. And they have to be placed more than six inches from each other, so they can't yep. be clumped up. And they have to be placed more than three inches from those objectives. Then somehow, you've got to find a spot for your faction terrain, which probably has a restriction that it has to be placed in your territory more than 12 inches from enemy territory, which then blocks off another area. Oh, by the way, now you have to place it more than six inches from the table edge. 
<laughs> and more than six inches from other terrain features, yep. and still more than three inches away from objectives. And its own restrictions, too. Like, uh, and its own restrictions, which that's probably covered most of them anyways. Right. So, <laughs> I, I, I think we need to make a video, or at least just sit down and do it ourselves, where we like do a bunch of examples and see if we can find if, on average, you can actually ever place your faction terrain. I know that yep. Luna Shrine is enormous. The knot um, holes are huge. You get right, now, right now, rules yeah. is written, you cannot use knot holes. It is, That's true. You cannot. You, you cannot, cannot use now, a knot hole in a pitch be, battle. Because of that, <laughs> I have a funny feeling that there's going to be an errata, maybe even day one, by the time you watch this video, there may be one up already, that says knot holes have to be placed wholly within 12 inches of the, the table edge instead. <clears throat> but you're still going to be very restricted. They're and almost they're almost like a six inch circumference. Like they're they're, they're huge. They're huge. Yeah. They're enormous, and you got to place three of them. Yep. Good luck. Because remember, once again, let's say this is your knot hole. This is actually slightly smaller than a knot hole. Yeah. It's a little wider, but you have a six. Oh, hold on. Let me do this accurately. This is about six inches. All right. So you have about this big yeah. an area that you need to find that is empty of terrain. Also within range of a table edge. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and, and more than six inches from table edge too. And oh, by the way, holy in your territory, yeah. and uh, not whole. I'm not sure what they're going to come up with, but like the lunar shrines has more than twelve inches from enemy territory. Yep. You got to somehow find this thing that is just enormous. You have these giant if you oh, circles oh, oh, on your table. If you are playing, in uh, your territories are like if the, the table is six. Like so, hold on. Six by four, and you're playing this way, so that you're here and here. You can't place a lot of terrain, that because a lot of the terrain says you have to be more than twelve inches from your enemy's side. Okay, yep. well then you block off, so you're now within only twelve inches of your side. <laughs> oh, by the way, you can't use within six inches of the table edge, so that leaves you a six-inch strip. And if it's devoid of terrain, oh, by the way, when you place it in that six-inch strip, it still needs to be more than six inches away from other pieces of terrain and, and three inches from objectives. Even better yet, there are a couple of uh, pitch battle uh, battle plans in there that have. Very small deployment zones too, because there's uh, I can't remember the names of them. There's one that's got a little tiny triangle that goes 24 inches in your deployment zone and to your back corners. So you have that's a new battle for the pass. That's the new this, battle. This for is your deployment. It's like zone. a tiny. It's like, no longer this. It's this. It's like a tiny little triangle, and then there's even the one that has each. Uh, it's, it's split down of war, right down the center, long edges. But you only have two little rectangles to deploy in, in the corners, and you can't even deploy in the middle. Now, if <laughs> if day one they come out with an errata that changes the rules for every last piece of scenery, giving right. them a lot more flexibility of where they can be placed, then, then this, maybe. maybe this is a, not as big an issue as we think. But I am saying right now that I think for the most part, even using their rules for where you place the terrain, that nine times out of ten, you will not find a place that you can place your faction terrain. And when you do, it'll probably be so restrictive that you might consider not even placing it. Because it might be... If it's somewhere that much out in the open, you might be like, but that's where I want to put my guys. Yeah. <laughs> I want to place my units there. Yep. And this is like the Loon Shrine I find a lot of times would just, I'm, I couldn't find a good place for it anyways. And it would just block off too much of where I'd want to place my, my guys. Now, if I'm even more restricted, I just, I can't understand. There's got to be an oversight. There's, there's, some, there's, there's something yeah. I'm not catching here. Yeah. There's something I'm not understanding about why they would come up with that. There must be an errata already out, and by say, by say already out, by the time this video comes out that we have not yet seen, or an FAQ or something that clarifies it. Yeah. So unfortunately, that means that we're going to have to, have to do some house rules at Mini Wargaming. And I don't like that because it means every time we put out a battle report, there are going to be comments that are be like, hey, you're not allowed. And we're like, yes, we know yeah. normally, but we're not doing that. It really looks like your scenery is within six inches of each other. We're going to ignore <laughs> setting up how you set up your battlefield. We may or may not use the scenery rules. I'll leave that up to the individual battle report producer, but I definitely won't allow them to put dice on every single piece because part of the experience of our battle reports is a cool-looking table. Yeah. Like, we put all this money into these awesome studios, all sorts of money into models and terrain, and then we're just going to litter it with tokens? I just... Uh, so I know some skirmish games get littered with tokens, and that's one thing, but when your scenery is all covered in tokens... Yeah. Defeats the whole purpose, right? I just... I don't know why we're trying to make such nice-looking tables if we're just going to have to do that. Now, the alternative is just use all games worktop terrain, but even then, you can't like custom build it. You gotta use every, every piece has to be like this. Well, there's a piece. Well, there's yeah. a piece. You can't have some cool converted piece using their scenery and still follow the pitch battle. I like, I, like, I like the idea that they had here where it's like, you know, you, the table's gonna be very random and where the terrain is, it's all six inches They've apart. They've always had but... a random way to build terrain, and I've yeah, always true. ignored yeah. it. That, it's yeah, just, yeah, that's but true. it's never been a must. Yeah, this is a must. If you're going to play a pitch battle game, it is you must do these terrain rules. Yeah, because the core rulebook has this essentially similar rules to what we're reading right here. Right. But these ones are like, 
must. Yep. And watch no. watch watch the errata just come out and say change the uh, change this also, sentence and train to say may. This may. <laughs> hey, that'd be an easy fix. Yeah, no right. kidding. But yeah. So that's too bad. Um, like we said, the we already went over what the battle plans changed. So the last thing we're going to talk about. Yeah, the battle plan. Like yeah, they're all the same. They, the maps have just shifted. They've changed all the deployment zones. Oh, and mostly they, for the better. They also gave you the option if you are playing a pitch battle game because they are all the same battle plans except for places of arcane power. If you or your opponent really does want to play the new 2019 one, you can do a roll off, and whoever wins the roll off gets to decide 2018 or 2019. I'll be playing the 2019 ones because I've already played so much of the 2018. Ones. Yeah, this, I have no reason to not want but to. But that play is 2019. that is that is a new that is one of the pitch battle rules where you can force an older version of the scenario if you're more used to it. Exactly. So the last thing we're going to talk about is our meeting engagements, oh! which I'm very excited about because yes. it's going to allow us to play a lot more games. I'm lost. So I love playing smaller point games anyways. Uh, you'll notice a lot of my Age of Sigmar battle reports are at 1250 because I find the game plays really well at 1250 for most armies. There's certain armies where it doesn't. See, whereas I don't generally like playing smaller point games. Like back in fantasy, I always want to play 3K+. Plus. In 40K, I want to play 2,500. In the Heresy, I want to play 3,000. In Age of Sigmar, I want to play 2,000, 2,500. See, I don't, because I, I find that the... Well, it's pointless a lot of the time, too, because you just kill each other until you're down to a reasonable amount, right? And then you start grabbing Then, then you start actually grabbing the objective. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand that whole concept. I just love seeing lots of models on the table. And I love that concept, too, but I find I get tired by the end of the game. Meaning, like, always. I, I, the, always. It's, 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 it's like playing Apocalypse in Warhammer 40K. The idea behind it sounds cool until you finish the first turn, and then you're just like, okay, let's not do this again for six months. <laughs> it's, it's a neat-looking diorama that you set up. But for the most part, because of the way I like to set up terrain, for example, I like to have a lot of terrain on the table. Having a huge army just means you're filling every little gap between the terrain with your army, and it's actually hard to set up. So I find that smaller points with the right scenario. See, this is the problem that we always had. You play a smaller points game, and you do Scorched Earth, and there's six objectives to grab, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't have enough guys to really control the table. Right. Meeting and engagements is now going to solve that problem. 100%. So now this, I, it's got my attention. I would love to play these 1,000 point games. It says, it, it, does it recommend or does it say 1,000 points? It says 1,000. It's meant to be played 1,000 points on a table that's roughly yeah. three by four. Oh, it actually, yeah, it even says points limits. You can spend up to 1,000 points, no more, on your army. I guess you can do less than 1,000 well, you, you can always, to. you can agree with your opponent and do whatever you want. It's true. But, but this they, is they, they designed it for 1,000 points yeah. on a three by four table. And you're probably at home thinking, if, you, if you're like me, you don't like playing smaller point games, like why bother? I don't want to play a thousand points. That's not fun. This is there's there's a completely new force org, new ways to build your armies, and there's even tiers of your unit or different. Can't think of it. There's like spearhead, main body, different facets of your army coming out of the battlefield every turn. Every, yeah, you yeah. basically they're they're called contingents. Contingents. Here. Thank you. So they basically <laughs> when you build your thousand point army, you have to put it into three contingents. Each contingent needs to have at least one unit, uh, right? Yes. Yep. Each contingent must have at least one unit and conform the restriction. Um, and so essentially there are spearhead, main body, and rear guard. The main body has, you're, you're gonna have to have at least two things in your main body. That's kind of your, it has one to two liters, zero to one behemoths, no artillery, no, um, and one plus battle line, yep. and then any number of other units that you want. Now, here's the thing. In all of these, the, um, the first off, you can't have more than two of the same war scroll in the yep. entire army. Second off, you have to use min size squads. Yes, that's my f that for whatever reason that's my favorite thing. With a couple of exceptions, one in the main body, your battle line can be twice the size of a min squad size yep. squad. You can never go bigger than that. So if you know if your min size is ten, you can never go bigger than twenty. And then you have your rear guard, which is pretty much zero to one or zero to two of everything. So yep. it can have a leader, it can have a behemoth, it can have up to two artillery, two battle line, and two other units. And it can double size any of its units. And any of those units can be double size, never more than double size. So no more 40 skeletons nope. in a thousand point games, only 20 skeletons at that's, most. That's the most you can get, and that's amazing. So the rear guard's meant to be the, sl the slower force, the main body's just the main body, and then the spearhead's meant to be the faster force, so it's yep. zero to one leaders, no behemoths, no artillery, zero to one battle line, and zero to two other units, and nothing can be double sized. Yep. Min units everywhere. Yeah. Now here's the cool thing. Like it has the same kind of, you know, randomly set up your terrain and choose a scenario and it has really neat scenarios. But the cool thing is in the scenarios, it dictates when those contingents are going to come in. And where. And where they come in. Yeah. Like which table edge, what part of the table edge they're coming in. And 
different scenarios actually have different orders. And it's even possible that different players have different orders. It's yep. always red versus blue. They actually say that. You yep. roll off, the winner chooses who's red, who's blue. And depending on the scenario, your main body might start on the table, your rear guard shows up turn one, and your spearhead shows up turn two. Or it might be that your rear guard starts on the table, and your spearhead shows up turn one, and your main, guard, main body shows up turn two. So it forces these to show up at different times. And if you're using any reserves, they have to still follow those rules. Yeah. So if you put something in reserve that's going to pop up in the middle of a movement phase, it can only pop up on a turn that it would normally be allowed to in the contingent. And it treats any enemy deployment areas as enemy models. So you can't come within nine inches of an yep. enemy deployment zone. Which and, is a small table, so. And units that have the rule that force them to show up on turn one or force them to show up and it would break the meeting engagement rules of showing up, they just can't use that form of deployment. They can't be put in reserve. Right, they just show up normally. They just, they, and in the rare yeah. case where you'd have a unit that wouldn't be allowed to be used then, which I, don't, I don't know if there's really any anymore. There used to be. I can't think of anything. There's that one War Scroll Battalion for the Flesh Eater Courts where they have to show up a certain turn, isn't there? I can't remember. Where they put in reserve. So just don't use those because yeah. you're, not, you're not allowed to do it. You right. can have one endless spell as well, only one. You're only allowed to buy one, and you're only ever allowed to spend 50 points to buy one command point as well. Right. Yeah. You can't. Right. So you can't go at 900 points and then have two command points. Right. Which, you know, I don't know if that's necessary to have that restriction. They felt um, it was, I suppose. But yeah, and it can have allies. But rather than a points limit for your allies, it's just one allied unit. Yep. And it cannot be larger than a minimum unit size. Yep. And it is not, it, it does count towards your leaders, behemoths, and artillery, but does not count towards your battle line, like normal allies in pitch battle. Right. So it, this is, it's, it's like a pitch battle form of building your army, but, well, smaller scale and everything. And, well, it's got a whole different chart. Yeah, but your ally yeah. could be a 500 point model. Like That's it, actually, true. You, it doesn't yeah. restrict percentage-wise what your ally yeah. is. So it, it could, you could actually bring in um, a big monster or something. Like a Morn Ghoul or something. Yeah. Or at 500 points, that'd be more like... like That's a 500-point model. Go Drag. Or more... Not Go, go Drag. Go Drag. Yeah. Go it's drag. like, he's 5'6". I guess, yeah, he's 5'6". Yeah, he's 5'6". Five, five yeah. Like, he could be brought in as an ally. Is there like... I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you'd want to at 1,000 points because I don't think it has any... Uh, yeah, it doesn't have any restrictions other than that. So yeah, I'm sure there's ways that people could break this, but that kind of defeats the purpose. That's, yeah, this isn't supposed to be... Though they do have, on the next couple pages, a tournament format for it, too. So I think... Games oh, no, no, it's totally meant to be as a tournament. Because yeah. it even says right here. Yeah. They're, they're quick. They allow you to play two games in almost the same amount of time as a single one. And to complete a five-round tournament in a single day, rather than like a three-round tournament. Yeah. So totally, it's, this is meant to be a serious... Competitive Age of Sigmar... I would, yeah, it's yeah. A mostly competitive way to play Age of Sigmar, yeah. which is cool because people are always looking for that. I noticed that in like Warhammer 40k as well, you've got your open play, narrative play, match play, and then they have organized play. And I continuously get comments wondering why we're not doing things the way that organized play is. Like, well, you have more than three of that uh, same unit. And I'm like, well, we're, we're not doing that. We're playing just match play. So people always seem to gravitate towards the most restrictive version. Yeah. And so whether you're doing pickup games or tournament games, it's nice that they give you one that they're attempting to do some balancing to. I'm assuming it's balanced. Well, mm. I'm assuming it's not balanced, but you know, I'm assuming that they tried to balance it. We'll find out once we start playing it. Another two main differences with the meeting engagements are the table size it recommends you to play on, which is instead of a 6x4, you're playing on what is a half of a 6x4. It's three by four, up to yeah. a 3x4, as yeah. little as 30 by 40 inches, which is 2.5 feet by 3.5 feet. Referencing, referencing kitchen tables again. Yeah. And there is, if you do want to strictly follow the terrain rules at home, then they have different terrain rules. Very similar to the battle uh, match or the pitch battle, but it, it's smaller. So like terrain, terrain can be within three inches of each other. The You're, faction terrain. Can, can, yeah, that can be within three inches of each other. And yeah. Same thing with terrain features. Yeah, terrain features can be three inches apart. Faction yep. terrain, three inches apart. So I see what you're saying, yeah. Yep. And we don't have, they don't use the triumphs. Oh no, no triumphs. Um, and, but the, no, sorry. They don't use the triumph from, if you won the last battle, the player that spent fewer points roll on the triumph table in the core rules. Yes. Not so the pitch mean, battle ones. I guess you don't use the pitch battle ones, you just use the core rule ones. That's weird. That is odd because all the pitch battle ones give you is uh, st stalwarts so you don't run away and re-rolling Yeah, like they're throws. good, but I'm just wondering why they would. I mean, yeah, why wouldn't they just include those two? Yeah, that's strange. Oh. But that's fine. Whatever. Um, so yeah, it's cool. We're going to be playing a lot of that. I, yeah, I'm definitely going to be giving this a shot as well as the open play card concept too. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with a lot of the new things they added so far, other than 
the terrain rules for pitch battles. So I'm curious to see how you are going to do that at home as well. So what do you what do you think about that? Are you also going to house rule it saying, ah, we'll just do whatever we want, or maybe you'll give it a shot and see if they what they've written up is actually solid. I guess I lied. That wasn't the last thing we we're going to talk about. Because one thing I'm sure oh, that yeah. you're wondering <laughs> is allegiance abilities and points cost. We did say we were going to talk about that. Yes. So and we're going to do that now. It's actually now, not that not that big of a deal. Yeah, we're not going to yeah. we're not going to spend a lot of time. So allegiance abilities that you find in the general's handbook. Darkling covens the same. Boom. Sadly. Dispos dispossessed the same. Sadly. Free people the same. Mm. Seraphin. There yep. have been uh, some simplifications. They added some new. They added a new spell lore, which is really cool. That's huge for them. So, it, and they, they they dropped. They changed it a bit. The biggest part is they added a spell lore. And we're not going to get into any more than that. Um, they did change their battalions a bit. Wanderers, same. Yeah. Slaves of Darkness, ninety nine percent same. There's like a slight change, a couple things, and it's just like a little wording. Iron Jaws. Um, they they got I would say a more significant change. They got the most changes out of everything. Here. I'd say so. They they got a new spell lore as well, which is fun, especially because they got the great big green hand of Gork, which I love that spell in the Gloom Spike gets, which lets you pick up a unit and place it somewhere on the table. Iron Jaws always lacked that ability, and they got rid of the stupid you know, for each hero roll a die. If you roll a six plus, they can choose a unit and they can move. Instead, they made that a command ability. So you have control over it. And on top of that, the command ability, if you're already within three inches of an enemy, they can pile in an attack. And this isn't the hero phase. That's pretty awesome. They changed a little bit of the... It's huge. It's huge. Um, I don't want to just gloss over that, but we don't have a lot of time. They, they changed a bit of the command traits and the artifacts of power as well. Nothing that's worth really talking about a lot. And they did update their battalions a little bit. Once again, nothing that is significantly worth talking about. <laughs> but are but are interesting. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll play some Iron Jaws and I'll tell you about it then. Right. And Lastly, do I have mine? I do. Okay, good. I got mine. We have in a separate pamphlet or booklet. It's not a pamphlet. It's a booklet. Uh, the pitch battle profiles for 2019. And for the most part, hardly anything got went up in points. A lot of things went down in points. I want to imagine they went with the classic Games Workshop method of uh, just drop points so you can bring more stuff. It's like you, you you at home, you already have a comfortable 2,000 point army you like playing with. Well, now you have... A 1,900 point army. Yeah, now you have an extra 100 points to play with. So go buy a couple more models <laughs> and now you're going to be comfortable with a new 2,000 point army for this year. Now, I do appreciate <laughs> that most of those points reductions came to the leaders and the behemoths because yeah. we always find that they're the ones lacking, especially behemoths, because a group of guys always works better than a, than a larger creature. So yeah, you need to bring, keep bringing those points costs down. But there have been some of the secondary battle line that have gone down as well. Pretty much across the board, endless spells went down in points, which is which nice. Which is great. Because for the most part, they just weren't <laughs> worth bringing. <laughs> the purple sun went down 50 points. <laughs> so if, if, we go, if we go through each faction, so listen for your faction, because we're going to do this fast. Beasts of Chaos saw a few points reductions, but uh, Razor Gores and the Zangor and Lightning on Discs kind of went up in points. Um, Disciples of Zinch, we saw a bunch of reductions in leaders and a bunch of reductions in the different kinds of demons as well. I'm not going to go over the tiny factions. Nurgle, we saw a bunch of reductions in points in leaders. And by reductions, I mean like 10, 20 points. Right, that's, that's the same across the board for a lot of these armies. And even a couple of the War Scroll Battalions went down a little bit in points. Um, that brings us to... Skaven Tide, no changes because they just They're came out. Brand new. They Hedonites, Hedonites of Slanesh, just nothing So because they just came out. Blades of Corn, also nothing. They just came out. And by just, I mean just enough. And then for death, death I'm, the, I'm the one who kind of covered death. So Legion of Nagash seen a lot of point reductions as well, except for a couple things went up. Direwolves went up 10 points. Necromancers went to 130 points from 110. For whatever reason, Nagash went up 50 points, and I figured, oh, maybe that's so you can't bring them in a 1,000-point game, but no, you could still bring them in a 1,000-point game uh, because you just bring two squads of Direwolves still. And um, yeah, if they made it in plus twenty points of Direwolves, then that would have brought you just over the line. Exactly, that would have at least that would have made sense to me. Uh, the more Tarks went down in points across the board by about twenty, except Archon went up twenty, I believe. Actually, he might have gone down twenty. I actually may have marked that wrong, but it, I think they all went down by twenty points. And then everything else: Morgast down twenty, Hex Rays down twenty. Graveguard actually got reworked. They are no longer a minimum squad of five; they're a minimum squad of ten. And they they went down in points as well as increasing their minimum squad. So it used to be 80 points for 5, now it's 140 for 10. 
So they went from seven, eight, point, 8 points a model, if you want to look at it that way, to 10 point, 7 points a model. And then their massive regiment bonus is now 360 points for 30 instead of 420 for 30, which is a good reduction. And I, I'm, I'm surprised because I always found Graveyard to be very good. So whatever that reason was, they did it. And that's pretty much... But now, Flesh Eater Courts, no changes, right? No, because they're a newer book. Flesh what, Eaters what about Night Haunt? haven't been changed. Night Haunt went down across the board, but in the same method as... Or the same pattern as everyone else. Down 20, down 20, down 20, down 20. And these are all the heroes. So all the leaders went down 20, except for the Dreadblade Hero, who did see a lot of play, went up 10 points. Cool. Yeah, sure, right? Now, you covered a lot of the destruction ones as well. I yes. Know, I know you want to go into detail, but we're just hitting the heads. I know. We're just, just, we're just hitting the heads of the stuff. Grim Gash Reapers got nerfed, though. They did go up in points. So everyone was using <laughs> can't, help Grim, it. can't help it. I couldn't help it. Everyone was using Grim Gash Reapers. 30 in every army. They went up 10 points. So now, not a lot. Just to clarify, we're not going to go through every faction here, because we kind of... We got through most of them, and then just had to film, so... Right. So, Destruction, which ones did you see reductions in the pod? Beast Claw Raiders seen a lot of minus 20 point reductions across the board. So you'll be able to fit in an extra unit there. M but maybe. everything. The minimum unit is like 110 points. <laughs> so, no change to Bone Splitters? No. Greed Skins, mainly no change. There's a little change in the point scots for Chariots. Gloom, <laughs> Gloom Spike Gets, no change, because they just came out. Iron Jaws. What is that? I did the Iron Jaws. Hey, look at that. Wow. All right. So, Gordrak, Mega War Boss, and Mod Crusher, boom, both down 20 points. Yes. I can bring more stuff. Orc Ard Boys, um, they lost their massive regiment, but they also went down in points. They so, went down by 20 points or 10. So, they're, yeah. It's, it's but awesome. overall, still cheaper than their old massive regiment bonus. Orc Brutes went down 10 points. All their War Scroll Battalions went down either 10 or, sorry, 20 or 40 points, which is. Pretty big deal. Essentially, with all the points reduction, once again, in a 2,000-point army, you're going to be able to bring an extra unit or buff up another unit. Or bring that War Scroll Battalion you always wanted to bring. Exactly. And that's, uh, yeah, there's nothing significant. There's not like, oh, that went down 60 points. No, it's just 20 points, 20 points, 20 points, 10 points. And that's for all of the battalions except for Brawl. I don't know what Brawl is. Apparently, it's balanced at 180. <laughs> <laughs> and to order... The Collegiate Arcane, say that they saw a bit of a points reduction, it doesn't matter. The ones, you could bring those big uh, behemoths with the leader on top, and they were the same points whether you had the mage or not. Now they're just cheaper without the mage. Darkling Covens, they saw a points reduction across the board. So you'll be to bring more of them. Daughters of Cain, there's, there's changes. We didn't look them up. Dispossessed, there are changes. Ah, uh, the, the warriors went up in points. The Witch Elves went up in points for Daughters of Cain. Okay. Which sucks, because that's what everyone used. Free people. We saw a bit of a reduction in points for a few things, which, um, except for the general on Griffin, he went up. Fire Slayers are the same because they just came out. Iron Weld Arsenal went down in points a little bit. Eidenet Deepkin. This one was weird. Uh, so it's it's they're usually both. they're usually perceived as really strong. They actually went down in points and everything except for the Soul Scryer, which is the one character it actually went up thirty points. Well, he's, a good, he's a good character. I guess he's but a still, good character. Why are they, Steve keeps complaining that they can't lose with them. And then everything and went, down went down 20 down points. points. Even like the big Eidolons <laughs> went down in 20 points. Oh, they're so good. Carriage on Overlord players are going to be happy. Their points cost went down dramatically. We're talking like 40 points per uh, each of the vehicles. Yes. So that's kind of nice. But they did not gain any additional battle line. Nope. Still stuck with one battle line. It's, <laughs> not, a bad, it's not a bad battle line. Hey, it's probably the only good thing in the battle tome. There have been changes to the Lion Rangers, Order Draconis, Order Serpentis, and the Phoenix Temple, but I don't know what they are because we haven't compared them yet, including the Scourge Privateers. Seraphin. Uh, same, same pattern, minus 20 on a lot of things, except for the Engine of the Gods went up 20 points, and Skinks went up 10 points as well. <laughs> so, take it for what it is. Uh, yeah, they were they're, oh, they're too good. And the Razor Dons, you can't bring them in squads of four anymore. Same with the Salamanders, you can only bring them in squads of three. Because yeah, apparently four was overpowered. That was, that was, the, they seemed, that was too much. So, knock that down to three. Keep the Seraphim players in line. Stormcast Eternals. Oh, my. So, we have... Just the heads. Okay. Everything went down. Uh, a lot of the leaders went down 20 points. Just not everything went down. Not everything, but like... He's the exaggerating. Yeah. It's like... It's there's so like, many leaders. It's like one quarter, maybe one fifth. <laughs> no, it's about half. It's about 50% of the no. leaders went down. Okay. It's closer to a third, maybe. So, Lord Aquilor, the Lord Arcanum, the Lord... So, the Lord Arcanum in all versions, the Lord Aquilor, Aquilor, the Aquilor, I don't know. The Lord Exorcist, the Lord Castellant, they all went down 20 points, except I lied about the Castellant, he actually went up 20 points. The Concussors, Decimators, Desolators, Evocators all went down 20 points. Except for the Evocators, I lied about them. They went up 20 points. <laughs> My writing is not great. <laughs> so I told you to summarize, man. Prosecutors, Protectors, and Retributors all went down by 10 and 20 points. It's just... The Sequitors went up. Sequitors went up. That's so right. at 130 points for five, I would still bring them. Yeah, that was only a little bit. It just, it's just a slight punishment for uh, Stormcast and different players. 
and the Vanguard stuff went down. And funny enough, all the battalions weren't really touched except for the Vanguard Auxiliary Chamber went down 20 points. That, that balanced it out. That's going to really make people bring it. And the Dias Ar Arcanum Endless Spell went down 10 points. Shadow Blades did not see the change. <laughs> Swift Hawk Agent saw a couple changes, which I don't know what they are. That is not that they changed the chariots. And this, this oh, the, you actually got it? I got it. The chariots got a massive regiment bonus. <laughs> nice. You can bring three of them for 200 points instead of the normal 240. All right. And the Shadow Warriors went down in 20 points. Yeah, it's huge. The Sylvaneth are in here. Yes. But we can't really talk about that because there's no stars beside any of them saying that they're changed because I believe this is actually what's going to be in their battle tome. Right, so it's kind so, of... But the Sylvaneth Battle Tomes have had some delays, and so we're, I'm sh pretty sure this is exactly what's going to be in there. Ex yeah, you can tell because there's a, there's a new unit there. Yeah, that's the new, but we're not going to talk about that. And then the Wanderers saw a bunch of changes, mostly reductions. And then, like I yeah. said, the Endless Spells, they mostly saw reductions. Like the Purple Sun of Shaiish went from 100 points to 50, to 50 points. Because that's right, it's garbage. Still not going to bring <laughs> it's it. Still not going to bring it at 50 points. But uh, maybe. It's kind of cool. It's, it's, it's a good blocker. You can use it to block things. But then what? your opponent can use it to block things too. And then just completely annihilate your forces. Yeah, no. No thanks. No thanks. Thank you, but no thanks. It's, it's that or a command point, right? <laughs> purple Sun of Shaiish or command point. Yeah, right? I think a command point is going to win that one every time. But we do have, like, the Malevolent Maelstrom is down to 10 points. Right, that's which actually... Is, which is nice to have something. Exactly. You're at 1990, you're like, what am I going to do with 10 points? Malevolent well, Maelstrom. Let's get a Maelstrom. How many... You have Wizards? I got 10 points? Boom. Perfect match. Yeah. Well, I guess you shouldn't know your army's, your opponent's army beforehand, but, yeah, whatever. Oh, and we're not going to talk about this. This is just the... These rain. are the Tomb Kings! But they didn't change. They didn't change They didn't change the points of any of the death units that are not what we listed. Or the destruction units that aren't on the list, but they're actually in here. I don't think I've ever seen them in the General's Handbook before. Now that I think about it. Yeah, they it. actually, it, yeah, they weren't in the General's Handbook before. Oh, and yeah. So then I just realized, oh, that is a change. They're it, here. I was going to say, yeah. All the just, extra order units that aren't part of anything. Which is the Bretonian Lord, so they, I don't, oh, well, you know, to be fair, these weren't in the last General's Handbook, so these might be updated points. I doubt it. But it's fair, sure. they, could, they might not be. Oh, wow. We have a lot of stuff. Yep. I, I don't know how I missed these. These are... Legion the, of As... Yeah, this is the Forge World stuff. The Forge World Chaos Wars. Tamarkin's Horde. Monstrous Arc... But none of the points have changed. Monstrous Arcanum. The only points changes have been in the Exalted Greater Demons. Hey... Oh, and the Morngul. Yeah, Morngul went down 20 points. It's one of my favorite models. It's, it's been nerfed since Age of Sigmar first came out. It's, it's not... It, it's a shadow of its former self. But hey, it went down 20 points. That's kind of cool. <laughs> That's all we're going to cover. I know we kind of went a little fast at the end there, but we've already covered more than one video really should have had packed into it. Yeah. And we, we do plan, like I said, we plan on making more videos to cover more areas. Especially, when I say more videos, some of it will be videos like this, but others will just be like us playing the different things. Like mm -hmm. trying to open war stuff, trying the meeting engagements. In fact, I think the battle reports you're going to see today are meeting engagements. Uh, is what I'm guessing. We haven't filmed them yet, so I'm not 100% sure yet. I'll try and push for that. Yeah. If I can. I'm sure you can pull it off. So anyways, thank you for joining us. I want to hear your thoughts. Leave it in the comments below. Also, any questions you have, comments you have, things you'd like to see us cover with Age of Sigmar particularly, uh, we'd like to know. So that's where we're going to stop. Thank you so much. Make sure you go and check out the battle report or battle reports that have been published today. We'll make sure there are links in the description below so you can do that. And happy wargaming.